Okay, so thank you for talking to the students at Waterloo, Anne. And uh, can I first ask you to describe your career to the students, uh, what you do now and how your career led you to this point? Well, you know, I never expected to be in this field. Uh, my background, I did my PhD at the University of Toronto, and I'm a psychologist. I'm a social psychologist, if you can believe that. And I started out in psychology uh, because I had a keen interest in understanding people's behavior, etc. At U of T, there was very much it's a, it's a focus on experimental design. So I did a lot of experiments, methodology, statistical analysis. I wrote code, believe it or not, in Fortran back then, 100 years ago. Um, and that was prepared me beautifully for exploring research methodologies and all that was going to follow. So anyway, I started there, but I'm very practical. So I had a keen interest in the law as well. So I took courses at the law school at the same time. And ultimately, I did work in criminology. And my PhD thesis was on psychology and the law, looking at empirical issues relating to the research that we did. And what was beautiful about it was that it prepared me for my first job. I wanted to work for the Attorney General, and because I rooted my work in something real, uh, real legal issues, I looked at cases and things, the, the Deputy Minister at the time, thank God, took an interest in my work and offered me a, a position, a contract position, on a trial basis because he said, all we have are lawyers. You're going to have to convince the lawyers that taking an empirical approach doing research studies is of value. I can give you a one-year contract. I said, great, leave it to me. So I started there, and then at the end of the year, they expanded it, and they, there was a whole department. So I had a department, a research services department, and we offered empirical research to lawyers, and it, it was really fun and a lot of work and excellent. I loved it. So that's the practical component. I always tell people, whatever you do, I mean, you have to work real hard. You have to study, of course. But if you could try to link it to something in the real world that might address your interests afterwards, it's always a good strategy. So while I was there, uh, one of the clients that I served, uh, who was heading up the police services board, uh, he ended up being appointed the first privacy commissioner, information privacy commissioner of Ontario. Uh, Jai and he's now Justice Sidney Linden. And so when I was doing research for him, uh, fortunately, he saw some value in that. And when he was forming a startup to start up the uh, Information and Privacy Commission, he asked me to join him as his first director of compliance, looking at investigations into privacy-related issues. I had also done some volunteer work for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. So he knew I had a keen interest in privacy and freedom and things like that. So I was at the Attorney General for five years. And then this offer came. And I thought, let's do it. And, and I've never looked back. I just had the most wonderful time. I loved privacy. I didn't know I loved privacy until I got into the field. And back then, I'm talking 87, there wasn't a lot going on in terms of, I mean, the web had just started. Email was beginning to proliferate. It was just the beginning. So I had such a keen academic interest as well as uh, work-related interest. And I just immersed myself in the literature, in the research. So I loved it. I, was promoted to become Assistant Commissioner of Privacy. And then after Justice Linden left, uh, I had the opportunity to apply for the position. And I was appointed Privacy Commissioner. And I've been doing this for a long time. This is my third, third term now, five years each term. So you know, never look back. Um, but it's been fabulous. And I always maintain an academic interest. I uh, wrote two books on privacy while I was doing this. And of course, we've written hundreds of articles over the years. But I've always maintained relationships with the universities, of course, here in Canada, but also all around the world. And that's the most important connection, is the relationships you build and that you maintain and always update. And I've done that both with the academic world and with the business world. It's very important. If you want privacy to be embraced, business has to embrace it. And engineers are the lifeblood of the code that is written for so many of the programs that operate privacy. So I always had a very keen focus on software design, engineers, computer science, those fields, to ensure that the people in those areas understand what I'll be telling you in a moment about privacy by design. Um, two years ago, I called it the year of the engineer. I went around the world, literally, talking to engineers 
at major organizations, you know, Adobe, Facebook, Google, Intel, HP, Microsoft, IBM, because I wanted to make sure that the model I was advancing in privacy by design, which was essentially embedding privacy into the code, into the data architecture, was, was sound and doable. I thought it was eminently doable, but I, I always test these things out. And there was no question. Every single engineer, software designer I spoke to said, of course we can do it. You know, we're smart, which of course you have to believe you're smart and be confident. But it's, it's a higher, I was gonna say a higher model in terms of privacy protection. It's also more difficult because I always advance positive sum, not zero sum models of advancing privacy. So zero sum, as you know, means you can have an in increase in one interest at uh, the, the expense of another interest such that the two total to a sum of zero. That's the prevailing model. It's a win-lose, either-or model. It drives me crazy because in the privacy world, you can bet if it's something versus privacy, privacy is not the winner. It's always public safety versus privacy or business interest versus privacy. In my world, that doesn't cut it. Nothing can be at the expense of privacy. But if you get rid of the versus and substitute and, the power of and is enormous. Make it a win-win positive sum solution. That's eminently doable. It's harder to do, but the end result is so far superior because you get two wonderful positive functionalities. So that's the methodology I always advance. And as I said, it's harder to do, but I always view the, the zero sum model as the uh, lazy man way, I shouldn't say man, but lazy person's way out because it's, it is the lazy way out. It's, it's easier just to do one and not try to find doubly enabling solutions. So now you are the <laughs> privacy commissioner, Anne, and uh, you work with information and privacy every day. Uh, how do you define privacy for the students? You know, there are so many questions about what is privacy, and I've always been perplexed by them because to me it's a very simple proposition. Privacy, in, in terms of informational privacy, which is what we do, is about data protection. You're protecting information that is personally identifiable, meaning data that is linked to personal identifiers, such as name, address, phone number, social insurance number, some meaningful information that renders the data personally identifiable, or that can be linked to the data to render it personally identifiable. The simplest way to define privacy though, and I often do this when I'm speaking to new crowds, and I have one slide, and it says privacy equals control, pure and simple. Because at its essence, privacy is about individuals having control over the uses of their data. The Germans have a fabulous term. Uh, it was a wonderful notion that they valued so much they enshrined it in their constitution in 1983. It's called informational self-determination. Big term, simple concept, that it should be the individual who determines the fate of his or her personal information. It's absolutely essential and it embodies freedom because you have to have the freedom of choice to say, yes, you can use my information for this purpose that I give to you freely, but not for this purpose, which I don't authorize. And obviously it's gotten much more complex with the growth of the internet and the web and ubiquitous computing and the enormity of data collection. But the principle remains, it's very sound, that you don't give your information to a company or to a government to do whatever they want with it, of course not. You give it for a prescribed purpose. We call that the primary purpose of the data collection. And then you expect it to be used for that purpose or purposes that are compatible with that purpose. And then after that, if they want to use it for secondary uses, they have to come back to you as the data subject and get your consent. That's the model at its essence. That's what privacy is. If you need a shorthand to think about privacy, think use. How are the data used? Now, absolutely essential to privacy is security. Strong security is critical. You cannot have privacy without strong security. But the term privacy subsumes a much broader set of protections than security alone. Because that whole notion of purpose specification and use limitation is critical to privacy. Having access to your information, very, very important to privacy. Having the ability to correct uh, data about you that is incorrect to, to ensure the accuracy of the data, ensuring that there's some measure of accountability by the data holders, often called uh, data controllers or data processors. They have to be held accountable for what they do with your information and then you have to have some system of redress 
if the information is used in ways that were never intended. So that's a big, big answer to what is privacy. But if you need a shorthand, think use and control of the information. Thank you. So, uh, so the internet today, how is it affecting people's lives? And how is it different from the world that we had before the internet? You know, in the olden days, before the internet, uh, there was this term, it was called practical obscurity, that some government department or company might have collected some information, but over time, it was just, there was just so much obscurity and, and it was going to get buried. It wasn't going to go anywhere. You didn't have to fear that this information would come back and haunt you at some later time when it was used in an inappropriate context, or something like that. Obviously, those days are gone. That ship has sailed. Right now, information about you, as you know, can reside forever online, can be used in a multiplicity of purposes that were never contemplated. And my biggest fear is that it's used out of context in ways that can really come back to bite you. And that's one of the problems I have, you know, maybe we'll talk about all the massive surveillance that has been revealed on the part of the government by um, Edward Snowden. Information out of context is very dangerous. It can present you in a completely inappropriate light. And when you're going on a dragnet kind of fishing expedition into all the data that's out there, which is what the NSA and CSEC are doing, then what are you going to get? You're going to get very poor quality information. You're going to get a lot of false positives, which means um, I'm not Osama bin Laden, but I get labeled as Osama bin Laden, <laughs> something like that. It's a hit, but it's a false hit, false positive, which is the most dangerous kind. And then the people implicated in the false positives have to undo this incorrect perception of themselves, and that can take an enormous amount of time and expense. So for, there are many, many reasons why I object to all of this. But these are some of the factors uh, that we need to consider. How well do you think people are dealing personally with privacy in their lives today? I mean, how, how, to what extent are they aware of privacy and acting appropriately to protect it? You know, I think, actually, uh, I think we owe a a big debt of gratitude to Mr. Snowden because really in the past year since his revelations hasn't been quite a year since June I can't tell you how uh, much easier it's made my job now it's doubled my workload there's no question but when I go out to speak to groups community groups things of that people who are not privacy professionals or in the business in the past I would have to lay out why they should be concerned about their privacy I don't have to do that anymore the tide has changed completely. People are abundantly aware of why they should care about the privacy now. And for the first time ever in terms of polling in the United States surveys, six out of 10 Americans uh, value privacy higher than public safety and security. That has never happened. And there is such distrust of government. There is massive distrust of data collectors uh, for all the reasons that you would expect. Um, as a result of Mr. Snowden's revelations. So the good news is I think people are slowly becoming more concerned about privacy and fully aware of the consequences to all of the information that they are also willingly contributing to in terms of online social media, Facebook, Google, etc. all the information you put out there that leads to uh, many data breaches and privacy infractions. You put it out there and you don't restrict the data in terms of setting your privacy settings and controls, which you can. Many people don't take that step and so then they're astounded when their information gets into the, somebody's hands that wasn't intended. So I always tell people, I was just at a school last week, I do a lot of mentoring of young women, and I always tell them, be very careful what you put out there because the, the measure you have to use is this might stay out there forever and I have no idea who might access it and in what manner. And I always tell them, be very wary of you know, stupid pictures you might put online that are cute and funny, you might share with your friends. Well, if that gets in the hands of a potential employer you're applying for a job, it's not funny anymore. 77% of employers now routinely go online and see what there is about you out there. And over a third of them categorically reject candidates just based on what they see online. So do yourself a big favor. 
be careful what you put out there, especially something that presents you in a compromising position. I think people are becoming more concerned about privacy. I think the awareness is going up. And certainly, we have more calls and inquiries as to what people can do uh, to protect their privacy and things of that nature. So all of that is good. But the bottom line is, whatever you put out there can stay on there forever. You have very limited control of who has access to it and what they might do with it. So I always tell people, think before you click. Think. You've got to act responsibly. You have to be present. You can't be like an automaton, uh, just my, mindlessly going through the day. You've got to be very ever-present and act responsibly. Uh, that's something I always encourage people to do. Thank you. And, and, and do you think that our perception of what should be private is changing? Uh, some people argue that privacy is declining uh, and that we just need to learn to live with that. Over my dead body. <laughs> what drives me crazy is people saying, well, you know, there's no more privacy anymore. Get over it. Or, oh, we have big data now, so that portends the death of privacy. I can't tell you how often the death of privacy has been predicted. And it's, it's an absurd proposition. Now, let me be serious for a moment, though. The, uh, my biggest fear is self-fulfilling prophecies. This is something I learned in my graduate school days, and it's probably the strongest thing that I've come to see in my career. If you say something often enough, People are going to believe it, and perception becomes reality, and that thing becomes real. So my biggest fear is not that we can't have privacy well into the future with all these amazing technologies and big data. We'll talk about big data later. Of course we can. But if people believe that it's not a possibility, that, it, that we've already lost the game, that privacy is dead, that is what I fear more than anything else, because then they'll throw in the, the towel, and, and they won't even try to protect privacy. So. Let me implore you as, as students, don't buy into that. I can give you dozens of examples of how you can embed privacy into code, into architecture, into information technologies and business practices and networked infrastructure. We've done this on the ground. So I don't say this from an academic perspective. This isn't some kind of postulation. In my world, I've got to show that it can be done and work with companies that are in the business to demonstrate that it can be done. And that's why if you go to our, our website, you'll see we, we must have a, a, close to 100 white papers that we've done with major leading companies. Don't believe that. But what we do have to do is demonstrate how can we protect privacy and, remember, not versus, and engage in other functionalities. And I'm a big believer in all of this. So business. The economy, my God, we have to have strong businesses to ensure that our economy thrives. And so we have to show businesses how they can use personally identifiable data, but in a way that doesn't deviate from the privacy interests of the customers. And I always tell them, my second book was called The Privacy Payoff. And it was to show businesses how you can gain a competitive advantage over the other guys by strongly protecting your customers' privacy and then telling them you're doing that. Customers will love you, so you will be assured their repeat business, and it will attract new opportunity. So I always think of it as a sustainable competitive advantage. Make privacy a positive factor, not you know this pesky thing we have to do. No, privacy drives innovation. It doesn't stifle innovation. It's only the zero, gain, you know, the zero mindset uh, that the zero sum mindset that thinks you can only do one or the other. Once you get rid of that very dated view, which is so yesterday, and think positive sum, then you can do anything. The world is open to you. And that's why I, I love talking to engineers and software designers and, and thinkers about how we can do this. And the only comment I've gotten back when I did my Year of the Engineer was they said, of course we can do this. But they said, they got to tell us right from the beginning. So whoever's giving us the instructions to write the code, they have to give us at that time that they want privacy embedded into the system. If they do that, we can do it. At a nascent stage, emerging technology, easy. Later on, when the code's all written and the program's in place, and then you want me to bolt on a solution after the fact, much harder, rarely is effective. So then I took that to task, and now I, I speak to boards of directors and CEOs of companies, and I tell them exactly that. You talk to your engineers up front. You don't do this, leave this as an add-on feature afterwards. And you will be rewarded in terms of doing that 
because not only will you gain the trust of your customers and their confidence, but you will avoid the enormous harms that arise when you use information in personally identifiable form. Data breaches will happen, identity theft cases, privacy infractions, you will live to regret it. So the win-win proposition I offer them is a strong, has a strong business model as well as a strong privacy model. So could you briefly describe your model and your privacy by design? Uh, what is and maybe an example? Sure, so privacy by design. The traditional way privacy has been protected is we have laws in place and if uh, a government body or a private sector company breaks the law, you can file a complaint with my office, for example. We, we do an investigation and then we offer you some remediation, some system of redress after the fact. The problem with that is in this day and age of massive data collection, uh, online connectivity, mobile, everything, there is so much data out there that I, have, I use a slide. If I see the tip of the iceberg, I'm lucky as a commissioner, as a privacy regulator. Most privacy infractions, data breaches, uh, remain unknown, unchallenged. I'll never see them because the, the, the bottom of the iceberg is getting larger and larger every day. The harms are growing. So privacy by design, I created it in the late 90s, but it really took off actually after 9-11. And the reason was privacy by design is all about being proactive. Embed the necessary protections into IT, into the code, into operational processes in a way that will prevent the privacy harms from arising. It's, it's a model of prevention and avoiding the risks as opposed to allowing them to escalate and then offering some system of redress. It's all about embedding in design, making privacy ideally the default setting so that you can offer privacy assurance to your customers. They don't have to worry about do I have privacy or not. They can be assured privacy. That level of trust can be bred into the system. As I said, the essence of privacy by design is that it's a positive sum model, not zero sum. That drives this. And actually, that is such a positive feature because when you go to businesses and companies and you say it's privacy or nothing, they're going to say forget about it. They're going to dismiss you. When you say it's privacy and whatever you're doing, I'm not saying don't do what you're doing, but here's how we can do it in a way that respects privacy. Then you're given a seat at the table. They'll at least listen to you. That's how I've gotten onto, onto so many boards, and I'm on the board of the European Biometrics Forum, for example, many years ago. It was precisely because I didn't say no to biometrics, but I said, here's the model of biometrics we propose. It's eminently doable, and it beautifully protects privacy and allows the biometrics to function. So we've had a lot of wins that way, even in the area of surveillance. Uh, we understand that we have to find the bad guys. No one wants terrorists to do whatever they want. Of course not. But there are ways to have systems that are respectful of privacy and do warranted surveillance, not warrantless surveillance. Do it in a way that is respected um, in terms of the, the courts and you need a warrant if you have a reasonable and probable grounds to believe that some suspicious activity is being engaged in that may lead to a terrorist activity. We have a great paper on that. So, and you might think, well, who's going to listen to that? People listen to it all the time. I've been invited to the Pentagon twice by the Department of Defense in the US to present on this. So people are interested. If you have a way that is practical and can work, that does both, people say, sure, I'm all for that. I just didn't think we could do both. And then you show them how to do both. So we've done examples in surveillance. We've done examples with smart grids, for example. Uh, you know, smart grids are, are growing. Well, the smart grid is still a relatively theoretical construct, but it's pre predicated on the growth of smart meters being attached to electrical systems. And there are enormous potential privacy issues um, in terms of the wireless collection of data. So we worked with half a dozen um, electricity companies, gas and electricity companies. So here in Ontario, we've worked with ours. Um, in, in California, we worked with San Diego Gas and Electric. In Germany, we worked with one of their uh, providers to show that you can collect the information wirelessly in a way that cannot be accessed by others, very strong security, but that the data can be assured that it's only going to be used in the same way exactly the same way that in the olden days the meter guy used to come to your house to do a physical reading of the meter in terms of how much electricity you had used 
and you see, that's the deal. You, you pay for electricity depending on how much you use. So, of course, they have to have some method of measurement in terms of use. In the olden days, it was a meter reader, gentlemen coming to your house and taking the number down. Now you can do that wirelessly. But into the process, you have to embed the necessary protections that that information can't be used for an unauthorized purpose unless you say yes to it. I, I'm a big fan of privacy as the default, a, a positive sum um, method of embedding not an opt-out, but an opt-in system of affirmative consent, and that's essentially what it is. And we have lots of other examples with sensors. We work with healthcare providers. Um, I'm trying to think of all. There are so many examples. We, we did a paper uh, two years ago on operationalizing privacy by design, and we listed um, uh, about 10 applications. We've, we've worked with CCTV cameras, of course, in terms of how do you ensure that you can have the surveillance that they provide that is warranted, and privacy protection. And we have a fabulous example, I'll keep it short, but um, in, in Ontario, the casinos in our province are run by uh, an Ontario government department, the Ontario Lotteries and Gaming Corporation, the OLG. And we worked with them, they have 27 casinos in the province, and we work with them to embed a system of biometrics that is just brilliant, and it's all opt-in, positive consent. When you go to a casino, all casinos have um, surveillance cameras at the entranceways for security purposes. There are a subset, very small subset, of uh, gamblers who are addicted gamblers. And they just, you know, they, they go to the equivalent of AA, they go to Gamblers Anonymous, they go through the 12 step program. And the last thing they're asked to do is to go to the casino that they frequent and ask to be put on the, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the list. It's a, a do not. It'll come to me. It's basically, keep me out of the casino list. I, I forget the name of the list. It'll come to me. So opt-in, positive consent. You go to the casino, and you say, please take my picture. I'll sign the form. I'm asking, self-excluded list. I'm asking you to exclude me when I walk into the casino, because that's one of the things that sometimes addicted gamblers fall back into. They try to sneak in, which is understandable. So put me on the self-excluded list. I want you, and if you see me in here, please escort me out. The problem was, this in the olden days, this used to happen all the time. The people would, I think there's about 15,000 self-excluded gamblers. The problem was the forms that they filled out would reside in a back room in some file cabinet in some office, and there would no, be no way of connecting that with the gamblers who were trying to sneak back in to one of these 27 casinos. So it was a fail, fail proposition, negative sum. And if that wasn't bad enough, so these poor individuals would try to sneak back in, they would gamble away their life savings, they would lose their families, they would lose their jobs, and if that wasn't bad enough, then they would sue the Ontario government for not having kept them out when they said they were. So it was a total lose-lose proposition. Everybody was losing money. They came to us and they said, we have a solution. We don't think you're going to like it, but here it is. There's cameras at the front. Why don't we use a system of biometric identification? We can get the face of the individual coming in. We match it, compare it to the people in our self-excluded list. And if there's a comparison, if it's real, then we do a secondary check with real life people. And if that's the case, we escort the individual up. As so I said, I have no problem with that. It sounds so solid. But the only system I will let you use is a system called biometric encryption. It's brilliant. It is the most privacy protective form of a biometric. And what it does is it doesn't create a biometric template of the face, which is what virtually all other biometric systems does, uh, which then makes you identifiable in the system. And then it can easily be used for another purpose, like if there's a crime in the area and the police come knocking with a warrant, you'd have to give them what, whatever you have. What biometric encryption does, it uses the unique features of the biometric to serve as a coding instrument of some other information, nonsense number, a lengthy pin, it doesn't matter. So what resides in the database is not your biometric template, but your biometrically coded information. And it's brilliant. It works beautifully. We tested it. The accuracy rates are huge. And it was solid. So we said, let's give it a go. We did a test. It worked beautifully. These individuals would try to get into the casino. The biometric, oh, and I should make very clear. If there is no match, so let's say I was going to the casino, and I, I thank God I'm not an addicted gambler, um, it would do my, my face, there's no match, 
deleted. There's no retention of any recreational gamblers who you want to attract, of course, to casinos. So, and we, of course, confirmed all of this. But if you are an addicted gambler, you go, your face is matched, they check it, security checks it manually as well, so double checks, and then they approach the individual and they ask, they say, our understanding is you'd like us to escort you out of the casino. Is that still your wish? By that time, the guy's running out the door. That's what I'm told. So there's, it's a win-win total proposition. We have saved the government millions of dollars. And I think lots of individuals have benefited from this. So that's one very concrete example of privacy by design. Are there circumstances, Anne, that would justify uh, governments monitoring the behavior of the public? I think there are. Um, when you are dealing with surveillance issues relating to terrorism, for example, that's the most extreme example, or law enforcement issues, uh, all privacy laws give wide latitude for law enforcement because you want the police to catch the bad guys, you want the intelligence agencies to um, certainly monitor suspicious terrorist activity. The, the, what you need for that, though, is you need to demonstrate reasonable and probable grounds to believe that something is linked to terrorist activity or a law enforcement issue. The police go to the courts. They, have, they get a subpoena. They get a warrant. And then they can arrest someone. That's completely permissible. I always say you forfeit your privacy if you break the law. But you have to go through a, a proper system of court authorization to do that. And what we want to do is create the parallel to that in the uh, law enforcement, not the law enforcement, the um, signals intelligence world of the NSA and the CSIC and all these surveillance activities, the five eyes. That's where it's lacking. After 9-11, obviously there was such enormous concern with the activities that happened that they just threw away the book in terms of embedding privacy into the system. And they said, create this huge dragnet, listen, find out what's going on. It was basically a fishing expedition. And they collect everything. Now, I'm sure they don't collect everything, but it seems like they collect everything. And the problem is that actually, I think you diminish the, certainly the accuracy, but your successful ability to catch the bad guys when you're doing this massive dragnet, and you're implicating so many innocent bystanders. That's my biggest fear. So if you have court authorization, you go to a judge, you get a warrant, by all means, proceed on that basis. You've had to demonstrate to uh, a judge that you have reasonable grounds to believe that something is happening. There's no issue there. What I object to is in the absence of any of that, people collecting whatever they want in whatever their ways, and those ways until now have been completely lacking in transparency. And if we have no transparency associated with these activities, we can't hold the government to account. You can't have any accountability without any knowledge of what's going on. So the government just saying, trust me, we're doing the right thing. We're here to protect you, don't worry. I say worry. That's not the model we want. The government is supposed to be there at the pleasure of the governed, which means we have to have an understanding of what they do. I understand there has to be some secrecy at times, but you can have the government reporting CSIC as the um, equivalent to the NSA in Canada, the, the CSE, the Communication Security Establishment of Canada. So CSIC should be reporting to a parliamentary committee consisting of all three political parties and then there can be some transparency to them. They don't have to tell the public everything's going on, but they, they can hold them to account. Right now, you have none of that. You have a circular system where there is no independent oversight, and that's what concerns me. How do you see privacy developing in the future, and uh, How will the students who are watching this video experience privacy in, in their lives? You know, I hope, I sincerely hope, that you have as much privacy as I do in my life. Well, maybe not my life, somebody else's life. I'm, an, I'm a public official, so I have chosen to give up some privacy. But privacy is essential, not only as a fundamental human right in terms of personal interests, but also at a societal level. If you, you need privacy to have freedom. Privacy forms the bedrock of all of our freedoms. And all you have to do is look at the historical literature on this. Uh, look at countries that have morphed from free and democratic societies into totalitarian states. 
the first thread to unravel has been privacy. So you look at Germany during the Third Reich. It's no accident that Germany is the leading privacy and data protection country in the world. It is no accident that they had to endure the cessation of all of their freedoms during the Third Reich. And they will never, ever endure that again. And they know that privacy is just inherently linked to freedom. And so that's why I want privacy for uh, our children and their children. It, it's also, as a psychologist, it's such an essential part of the human condition. You need moments of reflection. You need moments of solitude. You need moments to consider your options. You need moments for intimacy. Privacy is essential to the human condition. But so is connecting. There's no question. As I told you at the beginning, I'm a psychologist, a social psychologist. So I know that the human condition requires social connection. Of course, we're social animals. It also needs privacy. It's absolutely critical. You must have both. That's why I'm so enamored with positive sum uh, propositions. You have to have privacy and the ability to connect. In order to be human, you must have that. And we must have freedom. It's so essential to our lives. So that's why I'm hoping that you can enjoy privacy in your lives and find ways, as I know you are, you know, a lot of teens, kids in university, and people going into the workforce have found brilliant ways of how to protect their privacy. As I said, I, I do a lot of mentoring of, of young kids, and they're, they're brilliant. They find ways to make sure that their parents don't get their Facebook pages. I don't know how they do it, but they have other ways, and there's lots of ways to do this. And, and just a word about Facebook. I mean, I think Facebook's amazing. Uh, if I was a young person, I'd be all over it. I know that. And I, I really like Mark Zuckerberg. I think I've had several opportunities to connect with him. And you, could, you can bet he really knows how to protect his privacy. So what we need to do, as that's what I've said to him, and, and he's always open to the proposition of how do we embed greater privacy into systems of online social connecting. And that's what we have to thrive, to strive to uh, achieve. Thank you. My final question, Anne, um, is that the the students will be watching this video or graduate soon, uh, and they'll either move on with their working lives or they'll pursue further study. Uh, have you any words of advice for them based on your experience in your career? You know, it's so easy to do what you do in terms of your working life if, if you have a passion for it. There's no question. I mean, for me, the work that I do is just like breathing and sleeping and I mean this is it's just a part of my life so it's my life's work and I'm so fortunate to have found this but I you know sometimes you find things accidentally as I said I didn't embark on a career in the privacy field it was ancillary to what I was doing but I got the necessary skills that I needed to do this the writing skills the experimental design the statistical analysis all of that so what I would encourage you to do that's what you're doing now Get, really work hard, I, I know you are, really learn everything that you are going through now in terms of the skills that you will acquire that you will use in the future. One area you might consider exploring because there is such a dearth of data scientists now and everyone's talking about big data, big data is going to be growing and massive data sets, predictions that will arise from analysis of um, unexpected relationships. It's going to be invaluable, there's no question. But what I want you to do, if you enter into those fields, and there's a huge call, a demand for data scientists who can do this, find ways to do privacy and big data. Uh, I'm calling it, uh, I, I would say, big data uh, demands big privacy. And what I mean by that is, and this is what I do now extensively in the big data field, when I talk to the data scientists, I say, can you use de-identified data? First of all, if, maybe we could just routinely de-identify identifiable databases such that the personal identifiers are removed or pseudonyms, um, some other identifier are attached, something that removes the immediate harm of having this data being identifiable. Then you can do whatever you want with it. The privacy harm only extends to the data when the data are in identifiable form. Once you remove the identifiers, you can do so much more with it and without concern for privacy. So data analytics will be growing enormously. And I predict that 
all kinds of new ways in which to protect privacy and personally identify the data will be rising soon. There are very strong de-identification tools that are now being developed. Of course, there's very strong encryption. You can encrypt the data. You can obfuscate the data. You can add noise to the data. There are so many systems that just in the last two years that have developed. So I can't wait to see what's in the, in the next five, 10 years. So I encourage you, find something you like doing, something that you can pursue. Uh, if it involves data, it, ha it happens to be a personally identifiable form, see if you can weave in a privacy element. But pursue something with an eye to some practical, where am I going to go from here? I I've always done that, and it's, it has served me enormously well, because you need the necessary skills that you're acquiring now uh, in, in the university. But if you can just be two steps ahead and think, where would I like to go with this? And then you can perhaps shape, if you're working on a thesis or something that you're working on, shape it in the direction of what you want to pursue. Then when you apply for a job, people are very impressed that you've done this and, oh, you've actually thought about its application to a particular area. So I always say if you can maintain some practical notion of where you would like to go while immersing yourself very deeply in the academic work that you're doing, then the sky is yours. It's a win-win proposition. And I wish you every success. And this has been wonderful. Uh, on behalf of the university, uh, thank you for talking to the students today. And uh, uh, what you've said has been very valuable, and I know it's going to serve them well. My pleasure. Thank you.